Okay, so uh, this is a continuation of the previous lecture. So let me uh, recall uh, what our assumptions are. We have a domain uh, in C two, uh, the product of C with itself. It's an open connected subset of C two, and we have a function f, a complex valued function of two complex variables. The first variable being denoted by z, second variable denoted by w and we assume that the function is continuous uh, we assume that there is a point in the domain where the function vanishes and the first derivative with respect to the first variable does not vanish and of course we assume that uh, the function for each fixed value of the second variable uh, in the domain uh, the function is an analytic function of the uh, uh, first variable okay see if, <coughs> if this domain uh, really confuses you for some reason you can simply assume that this domain is all of the complex uh, the product of uh, 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 you know two copies of the complex plane okay you can assume d equal to c2 if you if, if you if you think that it makes life more easier to understand okay uh, <coughs> so uh, so here is the implicit function theorem which says that if the function vanishes at a point I where the first variable uh, the, pa the partial derivative with respect to the first variable does not vanish okay which means by that I mean you consider it as a fun function in the first variable freezing the second variable and then you substitute that point you de you take the derivative with respect to the first variable and then substitute that point that is the that is the partial derivative with respect to the first variable at that point and if that is not 0 the implicit function theorem says that you can solve for the first variable in terms of the second variable. So in this case you can solve for z in terms of w so you can write uh, uh, the explicit function g z equal to g g of w which will be uh, uh, an explicit equation for f of z comma w equal to 0 in other words uh, in a neighborhood of w naught what you will get is a function g of w such that if you write z equal to g of w and substitute it in this equation you will get f of g of w comma w equal to 0. So you have solved f of z comma w equal to 0 for z as g of w that is what the implicit function theorem says and now so what we do is uh, uh, as I as you may recall uh, the the first hypo the first hypothesis tells you that if with respect to the second variable free frozen as w naught this is an analytic function of z and at z equal to z naught this is a 0 and because the first derivative does not vanish it is a simple 0 okay and therefore by uh, I uh, we we proceeded after that to show that there is a uh, 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 there is an there is an open annulus surrounding uh, a finite uh, 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 a circle of finite radius centered at z naught cross uh, an open disk surrounding w naught where f does not vanish okay and uh, for all the va for all values of w in this disk uh, surrounding uh, uh, w naught we said that we could solve for z as a function of w okay with z lying inside a disk centered at uh, z naught radius rho okay and of course this rho is chosen in such a way that uh, it is the uh, it is the disk which isolates uh, the zero of uh, the zero z naught of f of z comma w w naught okay so this is the in this disk the function f of z comma w naught which is a function of z has only one zero and that zero is at the center that is how this rho is chosen and uh, the rho the way the delta is chosen is a little involved but uh, that is what I explained in the previous lecture and now for what, what I want to say is that for every w uh, in this uh, disc open disc centered at w naught radius delta uh, if I define g of w to be this function okay then uh, my claim is that uh, and if I call that g of w as z then f of z that z comma w is 0 okay in other words 
g of w solves the equation f of z comma w equal to 0 with z equal to g of w okay. So the explicit uh, the implicit equation f of z comma w equal to 0 is solved for the first variable z in terms of the second variable w in for all w in this disc alright that is what it says now I will have to prove I will have to prove this fact so the first thing I have to tell you is that uh, I, I want to tell you something about this integral okay uh, mind you uh, for all points on this boundary circle f of the function does not vanish that is because of the uh, that is because of this uh, fact that the set of points where the function does not vanish contains this contains an annular uh, open annular region uh, containing this circle cross uh, this uh, disc centered open disc centered at w0 okay so so i'm dividing by this term and this term doesn't vanish mind you uh, here uh, uh, the first variable lies on the on this disc centered at z0 radius rho and the second variable is constrained by uh, uh, this equation which says that it lies to within a distance of delta from w0 okay so i'm dividing by something that's not zero all right and mind you uh, if you look at uh, what's happening here uh, the variable of integration is uh, i've called it as, as zeta because i don't want to use z right i'm calling the variable of integration as zeta and uh, zeta is the first variable uh, 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 the second variable is fixed to w all right and if you take f of zeta comma uh, w you know that it is already an analytic function of zeta so i take its derivative with respect to zeta and then i substitute uh, uh, for the second variable to be equal to w okay uh, you, you can also write it as dou f by dou zeta of dou by you can also write this as d by d zeta of f of zeta comma w okay it's the same thing because you're freezing the second variable to w and you're taking derivative with respect to the first variable right now the point i want to make is that uh, uh, since uh, and you know of course uh, the derivative of an analytic function is also an analytic function okay so since f of z uh, uh, since f of zeta comma w is an analytic function uh, for fixed w its derivative with respect to the first variable is also an analytic function uh, for fixed values of the say uh, for the fixed value of w and therefore this is an analytic function this is an analytic function of zeta this is also an analytic function of zeta this is just simply the identity which is the identity function and uh, what we have in the denominator is also an analytic function of zeta for this fixed w so this integrand is an analytic function of zeta and it uh, it's uh, and the denominator does not vanish so this so this integral is well defined okay and uh, 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 this integral is well defined and you are going to get uh, you are going to get a function of w because you are going to integrate with respect to uh, see for a for a path integral to be well defined all you need is that the integrand is a continuous function on the path you do not need anything else okay. So for this uh, function uh, for this integral to be well defined uh, I just need the integrand to be a continuous function but in fact it is a quotient of analytic functions with that with the denominator analytic function not vanishing so certainly it is a continuous function so this integral exists and after you integrated out uh, the variable zeta goes away and what is left out is only a function of w I am calling that as g of w so this function is well defined all right. Now the claim is that this function uh, solves f of z comma w equal to 0 okay that is the claim. Now so uh, and I have to also tell you that that value of g of w if I call it as z then I have to tell you that uh, 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 the value z is taken by g at w only once okay that is what I want to say that is I am just saying that z is uh, uh, you know uh, it is a simple 0 of f of z comma zeta comma w for w in this neighborhood right. Um, all right so let us so let me prove this uh, so what I am going to do is uh, let me go to this side of the board and uh, 
again the the method of proof is essentially uh, the same uh, as we uh, did for the inverse function theorem uh, if you if you look at the proof of the inverse function theorem you can see that I am more or less following the same ideas. So what I will do is I will do the following thing uh, firstly we define uh, 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 1 by 2 pi i integral over mod zeta minus z not equal to rho uh, and then I will I will write the same expression but I will forget I will not write the zeta so I will simply write do f zeta comma uh, neta by do zeta at uh, zeta comma w t zeta by uh, f of zeta comma w okay suppose we define this for for uh, mod w minus w not strictly s and delta mind you this integral also makes sense this integral makes sense because again you know the integrand is uh, the numerator is an analytic function uh, it is just uh, you take f and you freeze the second variable to be w then it is an analytic function of the first variable you take its derivative with respect to the first variable and you know the derivative of an analytic function is again an analytic function therefore this is an analytic function uh, and it is just the derivative of the uh, the function in the denominator so it is a logarithmic derivative actually right and so in other words what this is is just uh, you are just taking the integral of the logarithmic derivative of f but then uh, if you take the integral of the logarithmic derivative of f and divide by 2 pi i what you would get is by the argument principle you are going to get the uh, number of zeros minus number of poles uh, counted with multiplicity the first thing I need to say uh, is the following uh, first of all uh, uh, n of w is, is, is well defined and is an integer okay it is well defined because uh, 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 the, the denominator function does not vanish on the boundary uh, uh, on this path on the circle where uh, where the variable of integration lies the denominator function does not vanish because that is how we chose this uh, that is how we have chosen this rho and delta okay. So uh, first of all this integral is well defined and uh, since it is the logarithmic derivative of the denominator it is going to be an integer it is a logarithmic derivative of the denominator divided by 2 pi i so it is going to be an integer which is going to be number of zeros minus number of poles counted with multiplicity so it is an integer valued function and uh, it is an exercise that uh, we have done before uh, uh, in the proofs of several other theorems it is easy to check that n of w is actually an analytic function of w for w in this disk okay so let me write that down also n of w is analytic in w for mod w minus w not less than delta okay we have we have proved a similar statement uh, earlier so this is uh, 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 so you see you have an analytic function which is integer valued and it is defined on this disk which is connected therefore it has to be constant okay so this is also an idea which we have used earlier so this implies n of w is equal to constant uh, it is a constant integer and that constant will be equal to n of w not uh, for all uh, w uh, with mod w minus w not less than delta this is what you will get okay and um, you see but what is n of w not see n of w not uh, if you calculate n of w not you are then looking at the uh, number of zeros minus number of poles of the function f of z comma w not in inside this disk but inside this disk it is analytic and it has only one zero 
the 0 is at the center at z0 and it is a simple 0 ok. So, n of w0 will be 1 ok. So, what this will tell you is that n of w is 1. Okay, so uh, so the moral of the story is that uh, you know uh, for every uh, W with in this disc, I can find uh, I find that the function f of zeta comma W has only one single uh, it has only one sing simple 0 at a point z which lies inside this disc that is what it says because what is n of w n of w is uh, n of w is 1 ok will tell you that you know it will have uh, only one 0 and that has to be a simple 0 if it is a 0 of higher order then uh, 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 this number will go up right so moral of the story is that for every w in this disc i can find a z which is lying inside the disc bounded by this uh, circle such that uh, f of z comma w is 0 so what this tells you is that i have a function from this disc to the z plane okay so this means we have a function mod w minus w not less than delta from this set to c with w going to let me call this as g of w ok uh, if you want uh, let us call that as z ok uh, and in fact where it goes into is it goes into this disc the set of all uh, mod z minus zeta not z not is less than uh, rho it goes into this. So, basically I have a function like this you know what this function is uh, it sends to each w the point z such that f of z comma w is 0 such that f of z comma w is equal to 0 ok this is the it sends for every it sends every w to the unique uh, uh, simple pole of uh, uh, the the unique uh, simple pole of this integrand which is essentially uh, the unique simple 0 of f of f of zeta comma w namely it is a unique value z such that f of zeta comma w uh, such that f of z comma w is 0 ok for every w I am getting a z right this is my function and uh, in fact um, in fact there is uh, uh, there is also another way of looking at it and which is as follows namely uh, uh, I will have to tell you that uh, I mean uh, there is something here that I have to prove I will have to say that this see after all I am getting a function here w going to uh, some function of w which I am calling as z but I am calling that function as, as g and uh, I have written that the formula for g is this ok. So, I will have to tell you that this uh, that g is given by this formula that g is given by this formula it gives a value z satisfying uh, f of z comma w equal to 0 ok. So, I will have to only show that this formula is correct all right. So, how do I do that that is again very simple application of uh, uh, residue theorem. So, you see uh, consider now let us consider the that that integral 1 by 2 pi i integral over mod zeta minus z not equal to rho uh, zeta uh, dou zeta by dou 
sorry do f by do zeta at zeta comma w t zeta by f of zeta comma w for mod w minus w not less than delta consider this ok. Now the what is the integrand? The integrand is zeta uh, uh, actually t by uh, so you know if you want I can ok so let me write it like this d by d uh, zeta of f of zeta comma w divided by f of zeta comma w this is the integrand and consider the of course w is fixed ok this for this is defined for fixed w uh, lying in this open disc. So you consider this integrand as a function of zeta because the variable of integration is zeta ok. Uh, if you look at this integrand you will see that uh, uh, it is an analytic function ok and uh, it is analytic not only it is analytic in the uh, on this disc and it is interior alright and uh, you will see that uh, uh, it will have it will have only one simple pole namely that will correspond to a simple 0 of the denominator where that 0 is zeta equal to z which comes because of this ok. So this if this is analytic in uh, mod zeta minus z not uh, less than or equal to rho uh, with a simple uh, 0 at uh, zeta equal to z ok. There is a value there is a value uh, z where f of z comma w is 0 first that is all that that comes from here ok that is because n of because this n of w is 1. So there is a z and there is only one z ok and uh, the for that z f of z comma w is 0 for the given w and the 0 is simple of order 1 ok that is all uh, uh, that is all completely you know buried in this statement that n of w is 1 right now take that z that z will be the only pole for this function and it will be a simple pole. So you know if you take 1 by 2 pi i integrate over a curve a function uh, then by the residue theorem will tell you that you will get simply the residue of the function at that point at that uh, at its you will get actually generally you will get the sum of residues at various poles. So in this case I will simply get this residue at the simple pole ok. So by the residue theorem by the residue theorem what will happen is 1 by 2 pi i integral over mod zeta minus z naught equal to rho of zeta uh, dou f by dou zeta at zeta comma w t zeta by f of zeta comma w is actually residue of this function zeta uh, if you want d by d zeta f of zeta comma w by f of zeta comma w uh, at zeta equal to z this is the residue and this is the residue at a simple pole and you know there is a you know how to compute the residue at a simple pole you will just have to multiply it by uh, the variable minus that pole and then take the limit as the variable tends to that pole that is how you find the residue at a simple pole. So, uh, so that will be equal to limit zeta tends to z uh, zeta minus z times the integrand which is I will get zeta t by d zeta 
f zeta comma w uh, by f zeta comma w okay this is what i'll get and well uh, the uh, and i claim that this is equal to z which will prove that uh, this quantity is equal to z uh, but uh, uh, but z is g of w if you want and so it tells you that uh, this is the formula for g of w okay so it proves that formula that i've written here right so so why is this true this is this is pretty easy because this is limit uh, zeta tends to z uh, of uh, zeta d by d zeta of f of zeta comma w by see the denominator i am writing this is f of zeta comma w minus f of z comma w mind you this is zero f of z comma w is zero by zeta minus z i am just pushing this zeta minus minus z to the denominator and you know you now if i take the limit here i am going to get derivative i am going this uh, what i am going to get here is just this these two are going to cancel i am going to just get limit zeta tends to z of zeta and that is going to be z okay so that proves the formula the only thing that you will have to think about is how i can cancel this without uh, ensuring that uh, this uh, derivative is non zero okay uh, that this derivative is non zero at z okay and that again follows from the fact that n of w is 1 okay note that so let me write that down note that n of w equal to 1 ensures that uh, d by d zeta f of zeta comma w at zeta equal to z is not equal to zero. this is non zero the derivative is non zero okay because of the derivative uh, saying that the derivative is non zero tells you that z is a zero of order 1 of f of zeta comma w which is what n of w equal to 1 says okay if this derivative was zero then n of w the value of n of w would have shot up it will not be one it will be some it will be an integer greater than one that's not the case okay that's why i can cancel these two guys i'll simply get limit zeta tends to z of zeta which is z okay so the formula for and what is this z this z is the unique zero of f of zeta comma w so it's a unique value uh lying in this disk uh in the interior of this is the of this disk where f of z comma w is zero okay so uh so that finishes that finishes the proof of this claim okay now i come to the uh question uh, more technical question as to when this function g that i have defined okay uh which gives uh the first variable explicitly in terms of the second variable when is that function g also analytic okay so the 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 answer to that is it will be so when the function capital f is also analytic in the second variable so far what we have assumed is that the function capital f is continuous in both variables okay put together it's continuous as a function of two variables and we have assumed that it is continuous in the first variable for every fixed value of the second variable okay but what we have not assumed is that if you freeze the first variable then consider it as a function of the second variable that it is analytic with respect to the second variable that we have not assumed so far we have assumed only continuity with respect to uh, both the variables variables put together which will give you continuity with respect to each variable separately okay so uh, what i'm saying is that uh, if capital f is also analytic in the second variable for every fixed value of the first variable then this g that you have defined is actually an analytic function of w okay so let me write that down uh, uh, uh so so facts number 1 uh if uh, f of uh, z comma w is analytic in uh w for every fixed z for, for for every fixed z then g of w is analytic in w 
this is the first fact okay proving this is again uh, an exercise which uh, uh, which involves uh, uh, techniques similar to ones that we have used so far so I will probably leave it as an exercise and in fact if a function is analytic then the natural uh, see you have a function which has which is given by a formula g is given by a formula and the moment you say it is analytic then you will then it is natural to ask what is the formula for the derivative okay. So there is an answer to that and that is uh, remark number 2 fact number 2 uh, in the above case that is when f is a function uh, analytic function uh, in the second variable for every value fixed value of the first variable and g is analytic uh, the derivative g dash of w is actually given by minus of dou f by dou second variable divided by uh, uh, evaluated at g w comma w divided by dou f by dou first variable evaluated at g w comma w where you know f is written as f of eta comma eta. This is partial derivative with the second variable and this is a partial derivative with respect to the first variable and then you evaluate at this point z comma w but now z is g of w okay and this is everything. So this is a formula for g dash of w in terms of capital F and g of w okay and uh, uh, so th I, I leave it as exercises for you uh, to check that these formulas are that these formulas hold uh, but the point I want to say is uh, this finishes uh, um, the statement of uh, the uh, proof of the implicit function theorem okay but uh, the uh, what I want to next say is I want to say uh, uh, why this implies the in inverse function theorem. So you know as a corollary you have the inverse function theorem. Uh, what you do is put uh, uh, you put f of z comma w is equal to f of z minus w okay where uh, you know f is uh, analytic on uh, 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 a domain in C and uh, f of z0 is equal to w0 uh, for w0 in that domain and f dash of z0 is not equal to 0 okay. So the inverse function theorem says that you know you take an analytic function defined uh, analytic function now of uh, one complex variable assume that the function takes uh, uh, assume that the derivative of the function is not 0 at a point then you know what it says in uh, sufficiently small neighborhood of the point the function is 1 to 1 and uh, you can write out an inverse function okay and uh, uh, so you know if you put capital f of z comma w to be small f of z minus w then you can see that capital f of z0 comma w0 is 0 okay then uh, number 1 you will see that capital f of z0 comma w0 is 0 because it will be f of z0 minus w0 which is 0 and second thing is if you take the partial derivative of this with respect to the first variable okay then you will get f dash of z okay and if you substitute z0 you will get f dash of z0 and that which is not 0. So dou f by dou uh, zeta of uh, zeta f of zeta comma eta at uh, z0 comma w0 is not 0 which is you know which is the condition uh, that we need to apply the implicit function theorem. So now if you apply the implicit function theorem what it will tell you is that is that uh, uh, I can uh, I can write uh, I can solve for z 
as g of w such that f of g of w capital f of g of w comma w 0 which means you are saying that small f of small g of w minus small w is 0 which means you are saying small f of small g of w is equal to small w which means you are just saying g is the inverse of f okay. So uh, let me write that down so you get the inverse function theorem and uh, so we get for uh, mod w minus w not less than delta uh, delta suitably small uh, chosen suitably small you will get z equal to g of w such that uh, f of g of w comma w is 0 that is such that uh, f of g of w is equal to w that is it means that g is the inverse g is f inverse so you get the inverse function so g becomes f inverse okay and in fact uh, you can see that for fixed if i fix a value of z then f of z is a constant i will get constant minus w and constant minus w is certainly analytic function of w when i write f of z minus w if i fix a w then this is f of z minus a constant and that is analytic because f of z is analytic so it is analytic in the first variable if i fix the if I freeze the second variable. Similarly, if I freeze the first variable z, then f of z becomes a constant. So, I will get constant minus w, and constant minus w is certainly analytic function of w with derivative minus 1, alright. So, it is analytic in both variables, right. So, uh, up according to the implicit function theorem, this g that you get will also be analytic, the g that you will get will also be analytic, it will be given uh, by uh, by this formula and you will see that this is uh, if you plug in uh, capital F equal to small f minus w in this formula you will get back the formula that we got in the inverse function theorem you will get back the same formula and you will also see that uh, you will get more if you plug if you use this formula uh, uh, note that we get also uh, of course we get uh, as before f inverse of w is 1 by 2 pi i integral over mod zeta minus z not equal to rho zeta f dash of zeta t zeta by f zeta minus w okay which is the which is the formula uh, for the inverse function theorem that you get from here and uh, and also and further you get this from this you get a very nice formula you get f da f f inverse derivative with respect to omega with respect to w is you take look at this you take partial derivative with respect to the uh, second variable. So, if I take partial derivative with respect to the second variable I will get minus 1 okay. So, I will get minus 1 divided by uh, I take partial derivative with respect to the first variable if I take partial derivative with respect to the first deri variable I will get f dash of z and then if I substitute for z g of w I will get f dash of z g of w. So, what I will get is I will get f dash of g of w. So, you get this formula okay uh, and this formula is not very really surprising because it is actually uh, 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 which is actually which is just uh, product the product rule applied to so I should uh, uh, ah, so here I have uh, I have written g of w but I have to replace the g by f inverse so this is minus 1 by f dash of f inverse of w and of course you know f inverse w is z oh I am sorry okay yeah there is a minus here I forgot so I you are right I should get a plus yeah thanks for pointing that out okay there is already a minus here but then if I take partial derivative with respect to the second variable I will get minus 1 so it will become plus thanks for pointing that out but yeah so essentially what you will get is you know uh, it is f dash of z 
times uh, uh, g dash of f of z okay is equal to 1 okay and that is just trying to uh, it is just got by applying product rule to g circle f uh, of z uh, is identity. So, it is just g circle f is equal to identity on z. See g is f inverse okay. So, what does this say? This says g of f of z is equal to z says g of f of z equal to z differentiate it you will get g dash of f of z into f dash of z equal to 1. So, it will tell you g dash of f of z is 1 by f dash of z that is what you have got. So, it is just product rule applied to this where g is f inverse okay that is not very surprising. So, uh, okay. so now let me uh, let me uh, end this lecture by saying something interesting about an open problem which is an open, open problem both in uh, uh, complex analysis and uh, algebraic geometry a very important Jacobian conjecture ok. So, let me explain what this Jacobian conjecture is. Uh, so, what you do is you take C 2 to C 2 Uh, map given by z comma w going to uh, f of z comma w g of z comma w okay so in general you know uh, if you want a function that's going from uh, c2 to c2 i have to take a point with two complex coordinates and i have to produce two complex coordinates so i have to give you two functions each function will vary will depend on both coordinates so I call them as capital F and capital G. Okay, in general, uh, the best kind of functions you will think of are that you know both F and G are, uh, for example, analytic in both variables. Okay, and uh, in particular, what I want to do is I want to look at the case uh, when uh, uh, F and G are actually polynomials in two variables. Okay. Uh, suppose we have a map where capital F and G are polynomials. So, F and G are polynomials in the variables Z and W okay and uh, if we we can find an inverse map an inverse map of the same type namely uh, uh, C2 to C2 which is given by Z comma W going to say uh, uh, let me use something else I let me use some other notation. So, I will get I will use P and Q So, assume that uh, the, uh, you have a map like this which is called a polynomial map because it is given by two polynomials and assume that of course, you know if you give me a polynomial map I I, I, I do not know whether it is injective I do not know whether it is surjective, but uh, uh, but assume it is bijective and assume that uh, there is an inverse map which is also a polynomial map ok. Assume that there is an inverse map which is also a polynomial map. Uh, which is given like this ok. Uh, check that Jacobian of uh, this pair f comma g is equal to a non zero constant number non zero constant complex number and that will that will hold also for the Jacobian of uh, p and q where of course, Jacobian of f and g means you take determinant of uh, 
you take partial derivative of f with respect to both variables dou f by dou z dou f by dou w then you do it for the other function dou g by dou z dou g by dou w this is the Jacobian determinant. Mind you f and g are polynomials in two variables if you take partial derivatives again you are going to get polynomials in two variables okay and uh, the fact is that uh, uh, this determinant therefore will be a polynomial in two variables but the fact is that if you have an inverse like this if this polynomial map has an inverse map which is also a polynomial map then I want you to check that this determinant which is a polynomial in z and w is not actually a polynomial it is a constant and it is a non-zero constant okay this is th this is probably uh, just fo just follows by uh, using essentially a product rule kind of argument okay. So you should be able to show that this is very uh, this can be shown trivially okay with some uh, uh, basic knowledge of calculus. Now the Jacobian conjecture is actually the converse okay the Jacobian conjecture is the converse which says that you know conversely if you give me a pair of polynomials f and g with the property that the Jacobian uh, is a non-zero constant then uh, the result is that there is an inverse map which is again given by a pair of polynomials okay there is an inverse map which is again given by a pair of polynomials that is the Jacobian conjecture and the fact is that this Jacobian conjecture I have studied it for two variables but you can set it for any n any n number of variables of course you can check that uh, uh, if I if I try to write this for one variable it is trivial to check that it is true okay. So the statement is really serious from the two variable case onwards so this is a Jacobian conjecture for two variables and uh, for you can write that for n variables okay. So but the fact is that uh, it is still unsolved even for two variables and it is a statement only involving polynomials which are so easily understood okay. So uh, it is a it is a it is a it is a very deep question and it the answers answers to answer this question people have gone into algebraic geometry they have gone into complex algebraic geometry they have gone into lot of complex analysis uh, but the question is still open so it is a it is a kind of question that if you solve uh, uh, if some young person who is uh, uh, who is taking this uh, course of lecture solves uh, he will surely he or she will surely get a prize equivalent to the Nobel prize in mathematics so you will certainly get a fields medal if you solve this okay so it is such a deep problem but it is so easily stated. So let me state it uh, uh, the Jacobian conjecture states that conversely <coughs> if the Jacobian determinant of f comma g is a non-zero constant complex number of course non-zero constant complex number uh, then there exists an inverse map uh, given by a pair of polynomials. P and Q okay and I should say that this is not only for two variables it is also for n variables for n greater than 2 as well that is also uh, that is also uh, the general case of Jacobian conjecture but the fact is even for two variables it is not solved okay and uh, uh, the reason why I am talking about this when I am talking about uh, the implicit function theorem and the inverse function theorem is that you see what is the inverse function theorem uh, that we have seen uh, says it says that see whenever you know 
the derivative is not 0 then locally you can invert ok whenever the derivative is not 0 at a point then you can find sufficiently small neighborhood of the point where the function is 1 to 1 so the you can write the inverse ok and this is uh, this is the inverse function theorem for one variable but you can make the same statement for in you can make a similar statement an inverse function theorem for several variables. So you know uh, for example if, if you want for two variables the inverse function theorem for two variables will be give me uh, a function like this and assume that f and g are if you want analytic do not even assume they are polynomials of course if they are polynomials they are analytic ok but assume f and g are more general analytic functions in both variables ok. Then calculate the Jacobian <coughs> ok the inverse function theorem tells in the two variable case that at every point where the Jacobian does not vanish ok I can invert the function in a neighborhood ok. So what I want to tell you is that uh, from the viewpoint of the inverse function theorem the Jacobian non vanishing will tell you that locally this map can be inverted locally I can invert this map and the inverse by the implicit if you use the inverse function theorem or the implicit function theorem locally the the uh, the inverse functions that you get they will again be analytic functions ok. So what analysis tells you is that this Jacobian non vanishing will allow you to invert the map locally and the inversion is achieved by analytic functions ok that is what analysis tells you but the conjecture is very strong the conjecture says is that you can find a global inverse and that global inverse is given by just two polynomials in the, in the two variable case and similarly if it is a n variable case it tells you that the globe there is a global inverse which is given by n polynomials ok. So uh, so you know what you will have to prove is that somehow uh, the local functions that you get uh, which invert you have to show that all the local functions uh, you know they all uh, can be chosen so that they all glue together to give a global function and you have to show that that global function is given by two polynomials in the two variable case and it otherwise it that it has to be that is given by n polynomials in the n variable case. So that is the that is the gap between what we know in analysis and what the Jacobian conjecture demands and of course I must tell you that you know if you prove that uh, if you prove that there is a uh, situation where you know uh, the Jacobian is uh, is a non zero constant but the map is not bijective then also you have given a counter example to the uh, uh, i mean if you are able to find a, uh, you, you know uh, if you if you can find a uh, uh, contradiction to this statement namely you find a counter example then also it will be a great result but no such uh, counter example has been found okay so you are invited to uh, try this or think about this. Right.